Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. And with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv You're listening to Revolution Radio. Welcome everybody. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio. Freedomslips.com And I normally usually open with a poem, but I'm unable to do so this evening because all my files are lost. My computer got corrupted, and so I no longer have access to a lot of that stuff. And so um, so we're going to forego the point. But this evening, and I hope that everybody is well out there, and I thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. I have as co-host with me this uh, Kathy Dunson. Kathy, are you there, sister? I'm here. You sound a little muted. I guess it's your new arrangement. Um, it could be. I can check the sound quality. Okay. I just wanted to. Yeah. Ask. No, this computer is completely different. I'm working on a loaner laptop, which I want to give a shout out to George and thank him for even hooking me up with this backup which i'm really glad that he did because uh, yay george <laughs> yeah because otherwise i wouldn't be even able to do the the shows that were we can uh, hear you things. fine i mean oh, i can't can. yeah okay. uh does it sound normal no no okay so maybe i should turn up the volume uh, so it's not as loud as normal then um Right. Anybody in chat want to co-sign that for me? Yeah. Or... <laughs> yeah. No, that, well, that's terrible because I've got so many guest appearances coming up. Oh, but that's right. Tonight's with Rob. Too. Yeah. And then tomorrow I'll be on with uh, John um, Pounders, Now You See TV. And then the following I'll be on with uh, Chad Riley. Uh, well, you sound okay. So we we'll clear it up right here while we can. You sound clear, um, but it just sounds like uh, you're talking through a sock. Well, that's not good. <laughs> but oh, it sounds goodness. clear. Well, I don't want to sound like I'm coming through a sock, <laughs> but. Um, it is what it is until I can get this all situated. Uh, hopefully, at least, um, you know, at least people will be able to be able to tell what I'm talking about, what I'm saying, and what I'm reading. Even though the sound quality will be off from what is normal, but I will definitely see if I can turn up the volume and maybe even speak a little bit louder and and see if that. Helps out yeah, in any way. They agree with me in chat. It sounds a little muffled. Oh no. Okay. Well, now you at least you know why. And um uh, and it's not, you know, the mic because it's the same mic I just converted over to this laptop. I, I have a very superior uh computer, you know, as far as my main computer. And so the sound quality, the sound card, everything is uh, of much superior quality over there. And so I'm, I'm guessing that has to be the difference because all the settings and everything are the same. And so anyways, just bear with me, everyone. And again, thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. We're going to talk about the Book of Enoch and um, also about Enoch himself, just as being a prophet and um and that is just terrible that 
things are not as good uh, just because I've got all of these guest appearances. Hmm. But anyways, um, and so uh, uh, Kathy, you had sent me a couple things too that you had wanted to possibly bring up and uh, talking about this particular topic. And but what is really interesting to me and something that I will uh, go into in greater detail in speaking about the Book of Enoch is that, uh, and a lot of people don't know this, but during the when the Dead Sea Scrolls are found. All of that material back in 1947, I believe it was, the Nag Hammadi codices and all of that material was found in 46, if I'm correct. But um, the Dead Sea Scrolls as a collection, there was a full entire manuscript of the Book of Enoch written in Aramaic, which you know signifies that it is older than all of the copies that we currently have now, which the two books, um, the Enoch one is written in Gies and was rediscovered as part of the Ethiopic canon. And then the second book of Enoch is uh, extant to us in Slavonic, which is interesting. And then there's a third Hebrew um, Enoch but it is more centered on uh, Ishmael, interestingly enough, um, as being the main character of that particular text, but it does speak about the transformation of Enoch into what is the angel Metatron uh, to be as a witness against the watchers for their fall and their interdiction into the affairs of humanity and so um i have a, a note that i uh saved from a commentary um i really like to read this it's called lost and rejected scriptures by um lumpkin joseph lumpkin and uh, he he says enoch was considered inspired and authentic by certain jewish sects of the first century bc and remained popular for at least 500 years. So that's contemporary rainiest with uh, the time of Yeshua. And he also added the original was apparently written in the Semitic language now thought to be Aramaic. So he confirmed that. Right, right. Yeah, and um, after this first particular, you know, just after sharing some discussion on it, I will actually read a little bit about um, some discussions and some confirmations of an individual that was approached with a, a microfilm copy of this full um, Book of Enoch. But what is really interesting about the whole discussion with this older version is that many people, um, because you know we have the Book of Enoch from the Ethiopic, um, they say it doesn't go back as far as this older version, you know, being found with the Dead Sea Scrolls would make it uh, thousands of years old and older than even the time of Christ or at least near and around that particular uh, time era. But um, because the newer versions and there's, there's debate as to whether a certain portion of the book uh, Enoch is found in the original translations, and those would have to do with many of the prophecies of Christ, which are included in the book of Enoch that speak of um, Yeshua, the Son of God, the Son of Man, and also about his returning with ten thousands of his angels, and you know, also with the saints, and it's a um, a book that was written for a future generation and are being the, that particular generation, in my opinion. Um, but also, in, when, when we come back from the first break, too, I'm going to share a portion from the book of Jasher, which speaks about Enoch and his high regard and his high standing with the Most High God. And... Um, why he was taken as basically as um, 
you know, to be a character witness against the watchers, but also um, to write down the testimonies of all the sins of the the children that were born of the watchers, which are the the giants and their involvement in what became the corruption and the pollution of the pre uh, the antediluvian age, and they were really the focus and the reason for the flood being brought upon the earth. And um, as it says in Second uh, Baruch, which I believe is the Greek version, there's also a, a third Baruch, and it's a Slavonic version, but it actually describes 409,000 giants as being... Um, slaughtered in the deluge of that particular of Noah's day and in the other one it mentions 109,000 giants and so there were when you consider um, that a lot of the text described they're just consuming all the the staples of the earth and uh, and then even going as far as to starting to cannibalize humanity um, the evil was very prevalent and they were even warring against each other and slaughtering one another and consuming all the, the goods of the world. And so, um, 109,000 giants, that's a, that's quite a number and the kind of destruction which could be created by them, especially if you consider that the stature of the pre-Diluvian giants was a uh, very much and greater um, than the even the size of the skeletons which were found even to 1800 1900s which were we're talking giants of 36 32 34 feet uh, I mean which is huge in, in comparison to what is discovered um, here in America during the time of the pioneers when they when they were knocking down all of these uh, huge stone structures and finding giants that were you know, 12 to 15 feet, uh, which usually here in America they did not, uh, or the earlier, I mean the at least the last couple hundred years, they weren't very much larger than that. But in some of the other places in Europe, uh, during previous generations, there were many skeletons which were found in excess of 20 feet. And there was even mention of um, Ecuadorian giants recently. A couple skeletons being put on display that I think were 24 feet. And, and so, and it's my opinion that the giants of um, the before Noah's flood were of very much larger stature. How much so, we don't know, but you know, some of the biblical texts, the narrative like the extra biblical texts, they speak of them as being as tall as the cedars of Lebanon, which are giant trees and and also uh, reaching up unto the clouds. So, um, you know, who knows how exactly tall they were, how big and how large in stature. Um, but the Book of Enoch also speaks of 300 L's, which I'm not exactly sure the, you know, the um, how much that is. But certainly they were a very much larger stature in had greater longevity than uh, the giants after the floods of Noah's day. Kathy, do you have a comment? Um, oh, I had um, pulled up 300 L's and converted it to miles once, and I don't remember what it was. Oh, really? Miles? Yeah, well, I think it was like a half a mile. I mean, it was insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Um, but I guess... Since we have a little time, what I'll do is go ahead and start reading from this this book of Jasher, which would be chapter five, just to 
set the premise for our discussion after the first break, but um, speaking about Enoch uh, and why he was basically, you know, translated, he was taken alive. He was one of these two witnesses, he and Elijah, and, um, and also this connects with the Revelation 11, the two witnesses at the end of days, because um, as I show in my seventh book, those two witnesses will be Enoch and Elijah. I know a lot of people say Moses and Enoch or, you know, Moses and somebody else, but um, there are many texts which reference Enoch and Elijah by name. And I think that that has to do with their having never died and, uh, and having never had to succumb to death and that the two witnesses of Revelation 11, they are killed by the Antichrist and left in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days, uh, which is also um, a type and shadow of the three and a half years of the latter part of the tribulation, which is um, what the when they come and testify against the Antichrist is during that second portion and that that is the part of the tribulation where he is out in front and center and um, ruling over what will be the the new world order the organization of the new world order as one world government one world religion one world uh, people one world economy all of that which you know the fact that we see all of this um reflected in where we are in this day and age is to in to my opinion um is a reflection of how late the hour is and you know that 21 trillion dollars in debt and climbing every second of every moment and at some point the party will be over and the the whole thing that they have been planning and preparing for with uh, the collapse of the global economy, um, you know, and the, the the world financial institutions and the order out of chaos and basically to recreate a new system out of the ashes of the old, um, that's what they have planned. And all of that, in my opinion, will be part and connected to what is the unveiling of the ancient aliens as the creators of humanity, which is a whole other aspect of the strong delusion that not a lot of people are, uh, are aware of or, um, you know, are, you know, connected to and prepared for. So much of the world will be willing and wanting to accept these ancient aliens as the saviors of humanity as the uh, the creators of humanity and the bible warns us about all of that um did you want to comment before i go into this Catherine? uh no that's okay go ahead i just i agree with you completely we're being indoctrinated into that mindset and i think most people well a large percentage of the people are are believing that yeah and so willing and ready and apt to believing it and uh you know the whole the popularity of the ancient alien series which it's is, a it's a fantasy that they willingly desire right. actually yeah, yeah absolutely all right so enoch from chapter five of the book of jasher and then we'll comment more uh, about this it says this and enoch lived 65 years and he bat, begat methuselah and enoch walked with god after having begot Methuselah, and he served the Lord and despised the evil ways of men. And the soul of Enoch was wrapped up in the instruction of the Lord, in knowledge and in understanding, and he wisely retired from the sons of men and secreted himself from them for many days. And it was at the expiration of many years whilst he was serving the Lord and praying before him in his house that an angel of the Lord called to him 
from heaven, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Rise, go forth from thy house and from thy place, where thou dost hide thyself and appear to the sons of men, in order that thou mayest teach us them the way in which they should go and the work which they must accomplish, to enter in the ways of God. And Enoch rose up according to the word of the Lord and went forth from his house, from his place, and from the chamber in which he was concealed. And he went to the sons of men and taught them the ways of the Lord, and at the time assembled the sons of men and acquainted them with the instruction of the Lord. And he ordered it to be proclaimed in all places where the sons of men dwell, saying, Where is the man who wishes to know the ways of the Lord and good work? Let him come to Enoch. And all the sons of men then assembled to him, for all who desired this thing went to Enoch, and Enoch reigned over the sons of men according to the word of the Lord. And they came and bowed to him, and they heard his word. And the and all the sons of and the spirit of God was upon Enoch, and he taught all his men the wisdom of God and his ways. And the sons of men served the Lord all the days of Enoch, and they came to hear his wisdom. And all the kings of the sons of men, both first and last, together with their princes and judges, came to Enoch when they heard of his wisdom, and they bowed down to him. And they also required of Enoch to reign over them, to which he consented. And they assembled in all 130 kings and princes, and they made Enoch king over them, and they were all under his power and command. And Enoch taught them wisdom, knowledge, and the ways of the Lord. And he made peace amongst them, and peace was throughout the earth during the life of Enoch. Enoch reigned over the sons of men 243 years. And he did justice and righteousness with all his people. And he led them in the ways of the Lord. And these are the generations of Enoch, Methuselah, Elisha, and Elimelech. Three sons and their sisters were Melka and Nama. And Methuselah lived 87 years, and he begat Lamech. And it was in the 56th year of the life of Lamech when Adam died, 930 years old. Uh, let me make this comment as well. Um, in you also notice that even uh, pre-Adamic humanity that they lived almost a thousand years, and it's my opinion that they also were of very much larger stature than um, than humanity today, or even humanity after the flood, because uh, Noah and his children, they lived, well, Noah lived a very, very long time, but his children lived almost 400 plus years until the stature and the longevity of humanity was reduced to 120 years. Even Abraham lived 175 years. But All right, continue. And it was in the 56th, year of the life of Lamech when Adam died 930 years old was he at his death and his two sons with Enoch and Methuselah his son buried him with great pomp as at the burial of kings in the cave which God had told him and in that place all the sons of men made a great mourning and weeping on account of Adam it has therefore become a custom among the sons of men to this day. And Adam died because he ate of the tree of knowledge, he and his children, after him, as the Lord God had spoken. And it was in the year of Adam's death, which was the 243rd year of the reign of Enoch. In that time, Enoch resolved to separate himself from the sons of men and to secret himself as at first in order to serve the Lord. And Enoch did so, but did not entirely secret himself from them, 
but kept away from the sons of men three days and then went to them for one day. And during the three days that he was in his chamber, he prayed to and praised the Lord his God. And the Lord on which he went, and the day on which he went and appeared to his subjects, he taught them the ways of the Lord and all they asked him about the Lord, he told them. And he did in this manner for many years. And he afterward concealed himself for six days and appeared to people one day in seven, and after that once in a month, and then once in a year, until all the kings, princes, and sons of men sought for him and desired again to see the face of Enoch, and to hear his word, but they could not, as all the sons of men were greatly afraid of Enoch, and they feared to approach him on account of the godlike awe that was seated upon his countenance. Therefore, no man could look at him, fearing he might be punished and die. And all the kings and princes resolved to assemble the sons of men and to come to Enoch, thinking that they might all speak to him at the same time when he should come forth amongst them. And they did so. And the day came when Enoch went forth, and they all assembled and came to him. And Enoch spoke to them the words of the Lord, and he taught them wisdom and knowledge. And they bowed down before him, and they said, May the king live. May the king live. And in some time after, when the kings and princes and the sons of men were speaking to Enoch, and Enoch was teaching them the ways of God, behold, an angel of the Lord then called unto Enoch from heaven and wished to bring him up to heaven to make him reign there over the sons of God as he had reigned over the sons of men upon earth. When at that time Enoch heard this, he went and assembled all the inhabitants of the earth and taught them wisdom and knowledge and gave them divine instruction. And he said to them, I have been required to ascend into heaven. I therefore do not know the day of my going. And now, therefore, I will teach you wisdom and knowledge and will give you instruction before I leave you. All right, we'll be right back, everyone. All right, welcome back, everybody. And um, again, I apologize for the sound. I don't really know what to do about it. Uh, again, this is um, just a temporary, you know, temporary situation. Uh, hopefully, I'll have everything settled very soon and I can return back to, you know, the, the superior sound quality of my other machine. But uh, I'm lucky to even be with you. Um, strange, after the publication of my last book, uh, it was weird because even before then, the last time, um, seemingly something happened to my computer then and it got corrupted and Again, this suffer this time, they, however, it got so corrupted that I'm unable to use it and um, it, it's just dead in the water. So uh, just bear with me and I, I appreciate all of you and uh, I promise to have it um, rectified as soon as I can. But until then, I'm just going to let Kathy do all the talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me um, get back to this text really quick. We'll finish up reading that, and then um, I'll share that that I was talking about with the the Aramaic because it just proves that they're you know hiding stuff from us and they're keeping stuff from us, and um, and that they've been in my opinion, doing this all along. And it's to keep the truth from people and to um, prevent us from knowing what certain scriptures, what certain very inspired books, and in my opinion, definitely the Book of Enoch is an inspired text. Um, the work that I've done with it in, in, uh, in my ninth book, in my opinion, affirms the veracity of the material. So, all right, 
continuing because there's just a, a little bit more here. When at that time Enoch heard this, he went and assembled all the inhabitants of the earth and taught them wisdom and knowledge and gave them divine instructions. And he said to them, I have been required to ascend into heaven. I therefore do not know the day of my going. And now, therefore, I will teach you wisdom and knowledge and will give you instruction before I leave you how to act upon earth whereby you may live. And he did so. And he taught them wisdom and knowledge and gave them instruction and he reproved them. And he placed before them statutes and judgments to do upon earth and he made peace amongst them and he taught them everlasting life and dwelt with them some time teaching them all these things. And at that time the sons of men were with Enoch and Enoch was speaking to them and they lifted up their eyes and the likeness of a great horse descended from heaven and the horse paced in the air. And they told Enoch what they had seen, and Enoch said to them, On my account does this horse descend upon earth. The time is come when I must go from you, and I shall no more be seen by you. And the horse descended at that time and stood before Enoch, and all the sons of men that were with Enoch saw him. And Enoch then again ordered a voice to be proclaimed, saying, where is the man who delighted to know the ways of the Lord his God? Let him come this day to Enoch before he is taken from us. And all the sons of men assembled and came to Enoch that day, and all the kings of the earth with their princes and counselors remained with him that day. Enoch, and Enoch then taught the sons of men wisdom and knowledge and gave them divine instruction. And he bade them serve the Lord and walk in his ways all the days of their lives. And he continued to make peace amongst them. And it was after this that he rose up and he rode upon the horse. And he went forth and all the sons of men went after him, about 800,000 men. And they wept with him one day's journey. And they went with him one day's journey. And the second day he said to them, Return home to your tents. Why will you go? Perhaps you may die. And some of them went from him. And those that remained went with him six days' journey. And Enoch said to them every day, Return to your tents, lest you may die. But they were not willing to return. And they went with him. And on the sixth day, some of the men remained and clung to him. And they said to him, We will go with thee to the place where thou goest, as the Lord liveth. Death only shall separate us. And they urged so much to go with him that he ceased speaking to them. And they went after him and would not return. And when the kings returned, they caused a census to be taken in order to know the number of remaining men that went with Enoch. And it was upon the seventh day that Enoch ascended into heaven in a whirlwind with horses and chariots of fire. And on the eighth day, all the kings that had been with Enoch sent to him, bring back the number of men that were with Enoch in that place from which he ascended into heaven. And all those kings went to that place, and they found the earth there filled with snow. And upon the snow were large stones of snow. And one said to the other, Come, let us break through the snow and see, perhaps the men that remained with Enoch are dead and are now under the stones of snow. And they searched, but could not find him, for he had ascended into heaven. All right, just a little bit more. In all the days that Enoch lived upon earth were 365 years. And, we know, and when Enoch had ascended into heaven, all the kings of the earth rose and took Methuselah his son and anointed him, and they caused him to reign over them in the place 
of his father. All right, and so this is a, a portion, you know, of the text that is not found in the Genesis narrative about Enoch. And we know also that from first Enoch that he was taken into the heavens before he was translated forevermore to no longer be found upon the earth. But he was taken up there and he was um, instructed but, and also taught and, and told to write down 366 books that Enoch spent 30 days and 30 nights um, just writing one after the other after the other and that the angel Pravail um, was his instructor and that he broke open the library of heaven in order to instruct Enoch on the heavenly secrets and that Enoch also wrote uh, as an account his witness against the watchers for what they had done in coming down to the earth during the time of his father, Yared. Because it was during which Yared also means descent. And it was during the time of Enoch's father that the watchers, the sixth generation, they came down, they abandoned their first estate, they left their place of habitation, and 200 of these watcher angels, led by Semyaza and Azazel, they came down and they were instructed because they had implored, they were angels of the Most High God, they had implored uh, the word of the Lord, which is Yeshua. They asked him to allow them to come down and to instruct the children of men, because they um, they saw how Adam had fallen, and they were basically like tattletales. They were um, talking about Adam and about how you know he had fallen short, and the one commandment that he was instructed to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that he couldn't even uphold to that instruction, and they were just basically bragging against um, humanity and about the children of men, and and the Most High, Yeshua, told them that if you were made of, you know, the many elements and not just of fire, that you would have fallen into deeper depravity, and you would have caused even greater sin. And so they challenged him. They said, no, uh, no, Lord, we would never fall away from the instruction of, of serving you and of teaching humanity about you because, you know, the angels, which the Hebrew word malak means messengers, and that's what the angels are. They were messengers between heaven and earth, and they were to instruct humanity on the... Uh, heavenly secrets and of uh, the knowledge of the Most High God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And so they asked him to allow them to descend to the earth. And he said, okay, I'll let you do that as long as you don't fall away. But if you fall away, know that you're going to be judged harshly and uh, a very much worse than even the way that Adam and Eve were judged, being placed into flesh and uh, condemned here to the earth where the other rebel angels, the uh, Lucifer and the one-third of the angels that joined him in rebellion, that caused and started the war in heaven uh, prior to the creation of Adam and Eve and modern humanity that they were already banished here to the earth. Um, but the watchers were the second incursion of the angels. They joined them. Um, they fell during the time of Yareth, and this was after Adam and Eve had fallen and 
were banished here to the earth and and modern humanity began incarnating into flesh form and so um and so as soon as they came down uh yeshua was correct of course and they fell away and then they made a pact they began to lust after the daughters of Cain and they because another thing that um, a lot of people don't know about and which is very much detailed in a book called the Kevin the God in chapter 100 is that they were given bodies of men they were placed in the flesh form when they fell when they came to this realm in leaving the high heavens they were placed into human form uh, even though they were still spiritual beings they were you know in, in human form and they were still something different about them they weren't like regular humans like adam and eve when adam his body being created the dust uh, the breath of life was blown into his body that was his spirit being married with his flesh. Um, and even though the watchers, they were placed in the flesh, there was still something significantly different about them. Um, were, the, uh, Zen, were the watchers like a, a different class of angels? Yeah, um, they're, the watcher angels are the guardian angels. They're the ones that are, um, they're tasked with, writing down and keeping notes on all of the children of humanity. And there's two assigned with each one of us. Um, well, we have, uh, you know, that internal battle going on where we have the angel of righteousness and the angel of unrighteousness dwelling within us. And then there's a guardian angel, which is the watcher angels, that are assigned to watch all of our behaviors and all of our deeds, all of our actions. And then every day at sunset, these angels are called before the throne of God. And the things that we did in our daily lives, in, you know, in the, our daily affairs, those are written down into the books of life. And so they're like guardian angels and the watcher angels, which... The reason they're called the Watcher Angels is because they are basically assigned to watch us and to report on us and to... You know. So these 200 were just envious and kind of rebellious on their own too. Yes, yes, exactly. And they, um, they were then instructed to come down um, and just, you know, to teach humanity and to be a witness of how things are in the hierarchy in the celestial heavens and to instruct humanity on those kind of things but instead they fell away being put into flesh they lusted after the daughters of Cain and then they made a pact to take uh, human wives and to you know begin to birth children and um, that's what they did and then uh, that's when the giants were born of their unlawful uh, unholy matrimony and um you know that's when this whole other race of being came into the world and so yeah i do recommend people read the kevra nagas k-e-b-r-a-n-a-g-a-s-t which means the glory of kings it's one of the foremost and uh most recognized and most prized Ethiopic text, um, you know, which again, the, the Ethiopians were being Christians from the time of the Queen of Sheba. Um, and, and also, they've been a very holy people since those times. And uh, many say that they were even chosen. And it also talks about this in the Kevin Nagas as well, that the Ark of the Covenant was removed from Solomon and given to his son who returned back after visiting Solomon 
and he was instructed to take the ark with him and that he took it back to Ethiopia and uh, some say it remains there to this day. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Uh, but I do know that it, in, according to this text, um, went back with not only Solomon's son through the Queen of Sheba, which I think his name was Menlech or something like that. And then um, all of the firstborn of his court and you know those that served him, all of their firstborn children went back with him. And so they established um, basically like a, a second Jerusalem type system there in Ethiopia. And they are very ancient Christians and um, have been following the traditions of Torah since that time and are considered to be a, a very holy people, which is why, you know, they uh, preserved the book of Enoch and it was found within their canon. I believe the book of Jubilees is also part of their canon, but they have more books in their canon than the King James Version does. Um, and this is another one of those texts there. It's called The Glory of Kings, but anyways, in that chapter 100 uh, concerning the fall of the angels, it gives great detail. Uh, the, the most detail you will found in, about the story of Genesis 6 and the sons of God mating with the daughters of Cain and creating a race of giants. And it does, in that particular text, specifies that the wives that they chose and took to be their wives, they were already uh, of the hybrid children of Cain, which those of you that know and follow my work, you know that Cain himself was a hybrid child firstborn son of the devil and that his children were different uh, and his bloodline, his lineage were different uh, already from the children of Adam. You know, I wonder, because I was contrasting how Cain you know, could have been so um, swayed and, and of the um, uh, nature of Lucifer um, you know, he, he wasn't, you would, you would think the first generation from Adam and Eve wouldn't be so, um, evil to murder his own brother oh, yeah, and, absolutely. and then contrasting that with Enoch and it's, it sounded like the, um, the Kings and the, um, population that they were, they were all seeking after God at that time. Right. Except for the children of Cain. Except for the children, of Cain. Yeah. I don't. You know, people don't learn about that, and and then don't question it. I know. I never questioned. You know, why would Cain have been so bad? You know. Right. Yeah. Right off. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You would think you'd get a little bit removed from actually living in paradise in the Garden of Eden, to um, having such a bad egg. Right. Yeah. Totally. I mean, the first child that is conceived is a murderer, a liar, and a deceiver, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's There's got to be an influence there. I mean, that's totally, just an obvious yeah. question. Yeah, absolutely. And then the fact that um, all of the aggression and war and, um, you know, all of these just uh, abominable characteristics and schizoid nature are passed down and propagated through the children of Cain uh, just affirms, you know, more and, I, and more. When I think of the, the daughters of Cain, um, I'm thinking of the Bacchanalian kind of uh, uh, parties and, you know, orgies. Orgies, and, exactly. Yes, yeah. Yes. And that's yeah. what the watchers were attracted to. Exactly. They were sent, you know, and it even, when we return from break, I'll actually, I'll pull up this passage and read some of it because it's interesting. Um it It'd gives make a you great insight. movie. It, it really would. I mean, the full story, uh, when you really understand what the the narrative, the biblical narrative is talking about, I mean, it is. It would make the greatest series of movies. Yeah. Um, if that somebody they don't want make, told. Yeah, exactly. That's why we don't see. You know, uh, instead we get things like Star Wars and 
which is, you know, the light and the darkness and all of that and the war between the sons of God, I mean, the sons of light and the sons of darkness. And it plays out all that way, but uh, we don't realize that it's based on truth. We just think it's just a fantastic sci-fi series. Everything, everything yeah. in history. Yeah. When it, yeah, when it really has basis in reality. All right, we'll be right back, everyone. All right, welcome back, everybody, for a second hour. Uh, we were just talking about the Book of Enoch and also the Fall of the Watchers, which um, the Book of Enoch gives us greater detail on the sons of God, the Gen Genesis 6, the sons of God taking the daughters of Cain as um, you know, all wives of all which they chose. But just to give you a little bit more detail, and this is certainly not the fullness of chapter 100 from the from the Keber and the Goss, but I thought I'd read a portion of it, and then I'll get Kathy to comment on it. And for those that don't know what I'm talking about, uh, it's a fascinating text. And as I said, this particular account gives us greater detail on what exactly happened during the Genesis 6 uh, conspiracy, as Gary Wayne calls it. It says this, um, And to you, according to what you wish, there shall be upon you the mind of a man and the body of a man. But take good heed to yourselves that ye transgress not my word and break not my commandment and defile not ye yourselves with eating or drinking or fornication, or with any other thing whatsoever, and transgress not my word. And straightway they were given unto them with his word, flesh and blood, and a heart of the children of men. And they were content to leave the height of heaven. And they came down to earth to the folly of the dancing of the hold on, um, of heaven, and they came down to earth to the folly of the dancing of the children of Cain, with all their work of the artisan which they had made, in the folly of their fornication, and to their singings which they accompanied with the tambourine and the flutes and the pipes, and much shouting and loud cries of joy and noisy songs and their daughters were there and they enjoyed the orgies without shame for they scented themselves for the men who pleased them and they lost the balance in their minds and the men did not restrain themselves for a moment but they took to wife from among the women those whom they had chosen and committed sin with them. For God hath no resting place in the hearts of the arrogant and those who revile. All right, I'm going to skip just a little bit. This is also an, an interesting passage, the last one that I'll read. And straightway God was wroth with them, and he bound them in the terror of Sheol until the day of redemption. As the apostle saith, he treated his angels with severity. He spared them not, but made them to dwell in a state of judgment. And they were fettered until the great day. The word of God conquered, who had fashioned Adam in his likeness or firm. And those who had reviled and made a laughingstock of Adam were conquered. And the daughters of Cain, with whom the angels had companied, conceived, but they were unable to bring forth their children, and they died. And of the children who were in their wombs, some died and some came forth. Having split open the bellies of their mothers, they came forth by their navels. And when they were grown up and reached man's estate, they became giants whose height reached unto the clouds. 
and for their sakes and the sakes of sinners, the wrath of God became quiet. And he said, My spirit shall only rest on them for 120 years, and I will destroy them with the waters of the flood. And so you see, you know, by this story, how unnatural they were. And um, even being put into men's bodies and men's forms, um, that taking the daughters of Cain as their wives, they brought forth a completely different race of being. Uh, I think a lot of people have trouble with uh, the idea of fallen angels having um, relations, sex with women, because they 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 don't know that part, you know, in the uh, right bo- uh, men's bodies. Yeah, it actually exactly. states that. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's why I I started from that particular portion because, yeah, um, most people. You know, um, when they read, you know, in Matthew the, that they are not given in marriage and um, that they don't take on wives and they automatically think that, well, the they angels, even think it's physically impossible to. Right, right. And that they think that, you know, there's no way that they could have uh, relations with um, human women. But then, of course, the portion of the story that they don't realize because they don't study these extra biblical, uh, extra canonical texts is that the angels were put into forms of men. They were given human bodies, which totally makes them being able to then copulate with, you know, the daughters of Cain, which is exactly what it says. And so, which is again, why I, um, like to personally, study the extra biblical material myself uh, so that these gaps are filled in. And so, you know, there was one video. I'm sorry. I no, no, please, go right now. But my mic was quiet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there was one video I watched today. God rules. Anthony um, did some uh, videos on extra biblical text uh, a couple of years ago. And he mentioned, uh, I don't remember exactly where it was, but that Paul had said, you need to read this in what is considered canon scripture. You need to read this. And it was what is considered an extra biblical text. I don't remember exactly what it was now. Yeah. It's, it's not one that we refer to very often. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it's kind of like, in I, I'm just equating it to my own little world. It's kind of like being in a Bible study and, and being told, now go and study this, too. Right, right. So you're getting fuller information, detail of, what is in scripture that fills in the the entire story fills in the gaps and and gives all the color and flair yes. and makes the entire story that's what i first encountered with reading your book lucifer father of cain that's the first place that i really got all that and i you know i could envision it like you know your book is just that way for me like you know watching a movie and and putting all the pieces together oh my gosh you know it's just like the daughters of Cain and their wild orgies and you know and and uh, you know there was one thing that always stuck with me and I'm reading it again in the firm in in your new book um about the uh I think it was the sixth heaven where the angel class the Gregory where they were singing their chants you know and and I think about the Gregorian chants and just they're they're so you know sad and i mean that's what the the idea you get about that but you don't get any of that stuff i mean scripture is wonderful and holy and i mean it gives me shivers but um all this detail that that we've left aside i wanted to to read this to you real quick i came across this today i've I've read this before Mm -hmm. but um the uh the book the sefer that is um a text that restores sacred name and um, and alliteration of names. Anyway, he said about um, finding about the apocrypha. The apocrypha is included in it. Uh, that at looking at the King James Bible as late as 1887 included all of the apocrypha, right. and that it was a publisher's decision to eliminate the books because they believed they could sell as many books without the apocrypha as they could with them. 
So it wasn't a canonization process right. that left those books out. I don't think very many people understand that. Right. And, you know, um, what, what gives them the authority to just leave all these books out? You know, and, oh, well, it, it'll be cheaper for us to publish it, you know, with just right. you know, this amount. Um, and so we'll just leave all these out anyways. And yeah. But over time, something else has happened where I saw a YouTube comment today that said, the Book of Enoch was the doctrines of devils. Right. <laughs> you know that is the Christian mindset. I don't. They don't understand what they're what they're talking about. I mean, it's it's ignorance about what it is, where it came from. I mean, the fact that there were so many copies found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It says that there were five copies found, and you're talking about this full copy in Aramaic. Right. You know, yeah. people That's don't understand. Right. They don't yeah. want to investigate. And I think what I call the gatekeepers are part of the problem there is the Christian church at large. And look what we've lost. And I think that's the desired end. And I find, too, that I get caught up defending all the time. And I know you do. I know Rob does. He has his, mm -hmm. you know, his little saying that I can never remember exactly, biblically endorsed, whatever. Um and so we, we lose that time actually studying and learning about it. I mean, there are few people like you that can bring it together. It's like in your, your newest book, the way that you've pulled together the different um, texts that account for the um, ascension to heaven of the patriarch. Oh, yeah. I mean, my goodness, nowhere else can that be found. And it was it was so incredible to me to be able to read it that way. Mm -hmm. So I can't, you know, I can't say enough about that. And and that's what we, we get here. But, you know, people aren't aware of it. And then instead of learning, they immediately say, well, that's not in my Bible. How right. does that sound? That just, that's the dumbest thing. It <laughs> Somebody really posted is. that on my Facebook page. I'm sure they're not listening to us. So I can say that. That's the <laughs> dumbest thing I ever, you know, and I'm very nice. Well, maybe you should get this book. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It, anyway. Yeah, it's amazing to me how much people will lock themselves away from willingly. And it's like, you know, for me, when I know that they're trying to hide truth from me, uh, I want to know what it is that they're hiding, you know, yeah. and I want to read it, uh, at least read it for myself before True. deciding on whether, you know, it's it's heresy or not, because oh, I get that so much. You know, from well, I've always had a great love for history. So that yeah. is the first point for me. And then it's like unlocking all the, the secrets and, you know, it, at the end times, mysteries will be revealed, you know, looking at that. But it's it's like, you know, having the hidden information and, and then how it all fits together in scripture in the entirety of it that's what is amazing not where i mean so many people are just you know the bible is like a behavior text like a way to live a good life it, it's right. it's it, it ha doesn't have any power that it that well i mean it does but it doesn't have the power that you get from the entirety of it from beginning to end and that's what's amazing to me that that you find putting this information all together in the way you have. We've got a question from George. He says, uh, do you believe humanity has access to all Dead Sea Scrolls? Some say the Vatican has withheld some. Uh, George, yeah, that's actually a really good question. And the, the answer is no. And actually, that is the perfect open for this that I was going to go into anyways, which is um, talking about this Aramaic Enoch scroll, a complete uh, copy of the book of Enoch in Aramaic uh, that was found uh, with the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it has been kept away. And it's not just one copy, but from what I understand, there were multiple copies, full copies of the book of Enoch found at the Dead Sea Scrolls that all of those full extent copies have been hidden from us. And so I'll go ahead and read this 
this story to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. It says this, there's probably a complete Aramaic over 2,000 years old copy of the Book of Enoch, both on microfilm and therefore also preserved as a scroll hidden away somewhere. Here's what I found out on the net about this. The story begins in 1990 during the Kuwaiti crisis. As fears for a major war in the Middle East meant that people who sat on valuable antiquities wanted to sell them. This is from an interview in 1994 in Biblical Archaeology Review with John Strudgnell, one of the Dead Sea Scroll editors. The interview is about events that happened in 1990. It says this, Herschel Schenck, there's this strange story that had been in the papers that at one point, two prostitutes, one Jewish and one Arab, came to you at the Ecole Biblique, the French school in Jerusalem, and I believe took you to a field outside of Bethlehem where they removed from their private parts of microfilms of Dead Sea Scrolls, one of them being complete the complete book of Enoch, is that true? John Strudgnell. Laughing, well, there are a lot of mixed elements, bits of which are true, but bits of which are false. Um, Herschel, could you tell us the story, John? There was a whore removing colorful, colorful accretions. There were women, messengers of uncertain profession, who showed me a microfilm not at the Ecole Bibliothèque, nor even in Jerusalem. Now, the incident in the field outside of Bethlehem belongs to a completely different story. And then I myself saw one, the Enoch microfilm. But I might save that story for my memoir, Herschel. This is the story about the prostitute, John. Yes, so I wouldn't be surprised if there were five other manuscripts from cave 11 sometime to be found in the near future. I wouldn't be overwhelmed if there were seven or eight, if none ever came to light. I would wonder who on earth had been having these hallucinations or why they are being held back. Herschel, are you currently working on trying to purchase or acquire these scrolls? John, yes, we've got people interested in it, but after the big upheaval in Kuwait, Things settled down, and the urgency of trying to get rid of this material evaporated. Herschel, you tried to acquire it during the Kuwaiti crisis? John, that was when it was shown to me. Herschel, and how did you communicate with the owner? Did you meet him? John, yes. Herschel, you're still working on it? John, oh yes, and there are two or three serious projected buyers. But as I said, to me, the most important thing is not just that there are projected buyers of that one manuscript, but the fact that it's highly likely there should be three or four others. And so that was from an interview in 1994 speaking about this full extent copy of the Book of Enoch written in Aramaic that he saw on this microfilm. And so I'm going to read just a little bit more, a couple more stories that also speak about this. Um, and some other copies of the Book of Enoch, which were found with the Dead Sea Scrolls. A Christian forum on the net reproduces an extract from a book published in 1992, which tells more about the background of the story. Abby Kotzman, in Understanding the Dead Sea Scrolls, on page 262, reports, a complete copy of Enoch in Aramaic has already been found. Quote, regarding the scrolls, John Strudgnell claims at least four other scrolls have been found that have not yet come to light. I've seen with my own eyes two. One of the two is a complete copy of the book of Enoch. According to Strudgnell, Israeli archaeologists Yajel Yajin 
is the reason these scrolls have still not come into scholarly hands. After the Six-Day War, Yadin confiscated the famous temple scroll from a Bethlehem antiquities dealer known as Kanda. Yadin paid Kanda $250,000, according to Strudno, and according to Yadin, the sum was $105,000, to encourage anyone else with scroll materials to come forward. But this was not enough, says Strudno. Yadin gave Kondo $250,000, where we'd offer Kondo $1 million five weeks earlier. When the owners of the manuscript heard that, they just crossed the Jordan River. These scrolls, like the Temple Scroll, came from Cave 11 at Qumran, according to Strudno. The manuscripts are now somewhere in Jordan. Various people own them. Several of them have been sold to big bankers. They're investments for these people. There's no point in forcing a sell if they really need cash, as one seems to now. I have the money. As for the other two scrolls, the one Strudno has not seen, Lancaster Harding, the director of Jordan's Department of Antiquities, on his deathbed told me he's seen three only one of which I've seen, so that makes four. Strezno is not concerned that the scrolls may deteriorate before scholars can look at them. They're all being kept very carefully. No one need worry about them. They're better investments than anything on the Israeli or the New York stock exchanges, he added. In this light, consider the following from Michael Wise in a new translation. The Dead Sea Scrolls, page 279. No trace of the parables of Enoch has been discovered at Qumran, and it is widely considered today to be a composition of the latter first century. C.E. If a pre-Christian copy of the parables were ever discovered, it would create a sensation since it is only text besides the Christian Gospels that uses the title Son of Man for the Heavenly Savior of Israel. All right, let me explain this story. Again, as I told you earlier in the show, the, from the, the current book of Enoch, which comes from the Ethiopic translation, there is contention over this portion of the text called the parables, which, as I said, mentions many times, speaks about the preexistence of the Son of Man. Yeshua as the Son of God, and speaks about, prophesizes his coming uh, with ten thousands of his saints. And it talks about also that, you know, he is the Savior of humanity, and that he will be the judge um, at the great white throne judgment at the end of days, which the book of Enoch also speaks about and describes in great um, detail the harvest at the end of days where the wheat and the tares will be separated. And so this, and because there's a debate as to the relevancy of that particular portion of the book of Enoch, the parables, um, many people are discounting that, you know, the book of Enoch actually references and prophesies about Yeshua as the son of man which this particular Aramaic version would clarify um, all of that and would confirm that indeed the, these ancient texts, these Hebraic texts, uh, indeed speak of Yeshua as the Jewish Savior Messiah, confirming that he indeed was the incarnation, which we all know, uh, of you know, being the word of God that he was the only begotten son of God and being born of a virgin. He was also the fulfillment of the prophecies as laid out in Isaiah in the ancient um, prophetic scroll and works of Isaiah. Uh, Kathy, do you have a comment? Um, I was thinking we were going to break. Um, I, well, what yeah, I was just thinking, well, but what um, I'm struck is how hard they work to hide the the truth or revelation from us 
I mean, from um, the things that L.A. Marzulli has uncovered, the, the giant skulls, the perhaps Nephilim skulls, and, you know, his latest um, Watchers DVD shows that they had actually um, cut off the photograph that he had found that showed the skeleton. So now right. we're going to right. <laughs> All right, we'll be right back, everyone, for final segment. All right, welcome back, everybody, for a final segment. Um, I just want to really quickly remind everybody, those of you that can uh, afford to do so, that uh, Revolution Radio really appreciates those that do support the network. And uh, for those of you, for the price of a Happy Meal, you know, once a month, if you can, please do just go to freedomsmith.com, click on the donate button, and uh, help to keep the network a, a reality and help us to continue in the outreach and the growth and the, you know, being able to utilize the network as a platform for truth and talking about uh, the different things that we do and covering all that we cover uh, on the network. And so, um, going back to what we were talking about, oh, um, and I do want to make mention of that um the whole story you know as far as that watchers 10 um the story of the the giant that was found in afghanistan and if you don't know what i'm talking about this is a truly fascinating story uh steve quell had broke it uh, a while back when he had talked to a c-130 pilot who spoke about how they were tasked with picking up uh, what was obvious to him uh, was a very large humanoid. And the story is that in Afghanistan, um, that one of the special operations units, special forces groups had gone into a cave in Afghanistan and they were confronted by a modern-day Nephilim, a six-finger, six-toed, red-haired giant um, that had slaughtered the, the first group and that the second group was sent in to find out what had happened to the first group. And they encountered this particular being. And uh, one of their buddies was killed. He was fighting with was like a, a staff, a, a pike, and uh, basically gutted them, and then they shot. They were in shock at first, but, you know, their instincts came, kicked in, and they all began to shoot him in, in his head and in his face. Um, he was able to take a lot of rounds and still, you know, move forward in trying to, to kill them, but um, he was basically, he was you know, killed, and then they were tasked after relaying the story of what they had encountered, um, a special pickup, a helicopter was sent in to pick up the body, and then uh, this body was to be transferred by this C-130 to Germany, um, if, if I have the details of the story correct. But anyways, um, L.A. Marzulli in this Watcher 10 series he actually speaks with, um, whereas Steve Quell broke the story with this airline pilot, um, the C-130 pilot, who talked about the story. He, uh, L.A. Marzulli, spoke with one of the shooters, uh, one of the guys that was part of the Special Forces uh, second group, two of them actually, and they all confirmed this particular story. And so um, the giants, which are spoken about and referenced in great detail all throughout scripture. Uh, everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. Uh, even the young children know that story. But what most people do not know is that the presence of giants um, being born of, again, of the unholy matrimony and the unholy copulation of the sons of God with the daughters of Cain, the watcher angels, the two under that fell, Semyaza and Azazel and the others who came down, left their place of habitation and being put into human flesh bodies, 
were then uh, fell and lusted after the daughter of the Cain, took wives of all which they chose, and birthing these children that, you know, were not born even in natural ways, but slid open the bellies of their mothers, coming forth through their navels, being of giant stature and uh, you know, just incredible size, reaching unto the clouds, as it says. Um, that, and that would work with uh, 300 L's, because that's 1,125 yeah. feet. <laughs> oh, excellent. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. But yeah, uh, fascinating that this story is incorporated and interwoven all throughout Scripture. The entirety of the, specifically the Torah, the, five, the Pentateuch, the five books of um, Moses that were dictated directly to him, uh, on Mount Sinai by the Most High God, uh, Yahweh Elohim, and um, you know, which is also the the portion of the text where we get Genesis and the whole narrative on the creation, the first seven days of the creation week, and so it's fascinating to see that even in this day and age, we have stories of these beings being as part of the fabric uh, of this world. And that even in the American, the Native American, the, their tradition, the stories of the Paiute Indians, the wars against the red-haired cannibal giants, which they backed into the corner of Lovelock Cave, and then the, you know, the multiple bodies and skeletons that were discovered in there of these giant skeletons, six fingers, six toes, double sets of teeth, which is exactly the way that they are described in, um, like, for instance, the the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Numbers and describing Og of Bashan, uh, Goliath <clears throat> is described in a similar manner. It's all confirming witness as to the veracity of the Bible. And also, it totally discounts and destroys the whole premise of the Darwinian evolutionary theory that and we so evolved they won't let us know about it. Yeah, exactly, which is why they are hiding it because they want to keep everybody brainwashed into buying into all of that so that we can in my opinion be later swayed into uh, accepting that the ancient aliens are the missing link that it was their uh, interdiction into the affairs of humanity that jumped the gun on evolution and created humanity in the form that we are now in, which is all being perpetuated. But if you just take a, another look at it from the standpoint of, you know, why are we still in Afghanistan, the United States? Right. You know, there, of course, we're there for the, the heroin poppy tr uh, exactly, tree. Exactly, yes. I mean, but then I guess the only other reason, because it's not military, is uh, could be something like this. Well, yes, that, and it. then also uh, because Afghanistan and the reason why we're still in Iraq too is because of all the, um, you know, the ancient artifacts. Right. And, and Would Afghanistan have that as well? Oh yes, oh. Uh, absolutely yes. Um, some of the oldest things like. You know that uh, the George Sukalos always wears that little gold pendant oh. that, that looks like an airplane? Yes. Oh, well, that's where. Okay. Yeah, all of that was found in Afghanistan. Isn't it ridiculous? Uh, that, and we're still, we're still there, and they killed bin Laden. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and then just dumped his body without ever letting Right. We know out. that's not true. He was dead long before, but so we're still right. there. People, why why don't you ask about it? Why don't you wonder? Right. And so, you know, we, we know things like this, and then it makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, they're lying to us about everything. It, you know, like the skulls and uh, the, um, which, what is the, the um, museum, the oh, scientific? Yeah. Oh, no. well, well, I was just going to say that, um, they you know, even, even when we began the invasion in Iraq, the... Uh, and even in Afghanistan, that the museums were looted before. Exactly. Uh, I mean, that was the first target. You know, all of those priceless artifacts and 
uh, all those cultural exhibits, all of that material was confiscated and just ended up disappearing and being stolen. And, you know, and that was one of the predominant targets. I mean, yeah. And that was a lot a story. Of I do remember that as a story. But, of course, you know, they, they made it sound like the locals were looting it. Right. Of course, they want to blame the locals. That way nobody ever goes looking for it, you know. And, that, you know, that's a convenient cover story. But, no, it was professionals because uh, – as soon, I mean, they, you know, it talks about them driving in all these trucks and loading it up like professional packers would, you know. I mean, they were organized and they knew what they were targeting, what they were after, and uh, they took it off. Yeah, Tom Horn has a story about that, too. Yeah. yeah. yeah I've heard that a few times. Yeah, so it's amazing. But um, let me check the chat room again really quick. Um, if you have any questions, everybody... Oh, we have a comment from George. She says, Strange that the Roswell incident and the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls Enoch happened at the same time. Yeah, I've actually got a comment about that as well, George. Um, it's my opinion that when the blooming of the fig tree occurred, which for those that don't know what I'm talking about, the blooming of the fig tree was um, the creation of the nation state of Israel, again, which happened in 1948, May 14th, 1948, the United Nations commandment to bring it forth as a nation went forward in um, November 29th, 1947. But it was actually created as a nation again in May 14, 1948. But anyways, that is the blooming of the fig tree as spoken about in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And when that happened, the, the powers that be, specifically Satan and all the powers, principality, the rulers of darkness, wickedness, and high places, they knew that we were the final generation. You know, remember when the Legion was confronted by Yeshua and they said, have you, uh, they first they recognized him as the son of God and they asked him, have you come to torment us before the time? They know that their time is up and that happens uh, with the final generation is with the blooming of the fig tree. And we are that final generation. And so that's why we are seeing since that time, the unfolding of all of these things, the, uh, you know, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls material, the Nag Hammadi codices, which for those that doubt of the, that they are inspired in any way, why would the Most High God protect them, preserve them, and have them be discovered 2,000 years later if they didn't have some kind of secret which he wanted to be revealed and to come to light in this day and age. Uh, if all of that material was uh, Gnostic and Satanic and uh, unworthy of even being read, why even bother preserving it? Why would the Most High you know, protect it and preserve it, just like with the Book of Enoch being rediscovered in the Ethiopic canon when you know the powers that be, the sons of Cain, had... Uh, basically eradicated it from the public consciousness. It's because there's important information contained within them that the Most High God wants to be revealed in this day and age with our being the final generation. And yes, that is my opinion, but as I uh, have shown in the work that I've done, many of those books are in fact inspired and contain a lot of the secrets that have been lost to humanity, um, which you know I revealed through all the different books and the works that I do and sharing all these different skeleton keys to help unlock so much of scripture that has been hidden uh, and kept away from us. And so, yes, it's my opinion that this is why we see that correlation, George, uh, is because we are the final generation, that we are the future generation. And so, um, Kathy, did you have a comment for us? Well, go? in your last book, um, in relation to the Book of Enoch decrypting that that revelation, right. I think that's something else that 
really points to, you know, it's revelation that we're seeing um, is fulfillment. It's, it's uh, proper place at, at this point in history. Yeah, the flat earth as the key to decrypt the Book of Enoch. I mean, it basically affirms the whole Darwinian heliocentric worldview, all of that as um, an outright lie. And so for people that want to look into that, um, that was my ninth book. But uh, Even with that, the... Um the obvious deception that's going on. I don't understand how people believe the big bang, you know, something out of nothing. And then all of this evolved and oh, randomly. Evolved. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. just, I, it's, it's so incredible to, to believe it. Any intelligent thinking person, you know, I can understand people being indoctrinated and programmed, but I mean, if you just stop and think about it, so well, I don't that's know. The thing. Most people don't think about it, you know. They never second guess their indoctrination. They just accept it for what it is. And, and yeah, and I think as a Christian, I tried for many years to try and wedge it together. Oh, you yeah, know, yeah. Because the authority the is telling you that right. that. So I thought, well, there must be some aspect right. of it. Some way you know? to just merge it together. Yeah. And it just needs to be, you know destroyed and i i think you know this revelation with what you have with the book of enoch and what so many are, are finding these days do a search on flat earth that you'll just uh you'll see how ridiculous it is and and you can see the reason why behind it you can see the the funding you can you can see i mean at the higher levels it's it's even more devious and and deceptive and um the powers that are behind it. Um, well, when you actually start looking into it, I mean, like yeah, the, whole, gotta do that first. the whole NASA thing, you know, with, I mean, the Orion mission and their declaration that they can't get beyond the Van Allen radiation belt, and yet supposedly they did all that um, previously. But, um, but anyways, let me read this really quick before we run out of time. I want to finish this whole story of these multiple copies of the Book of Enoch that were found in the, um, the as part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, and, and to affirm that, yeah, absolutely, they are still hiding stuff from us. And, um, and uh, I'd love to be able to get a copy. You know, I, I, it would encourage me to actually learn Aramaic to, just to be able to read it. But anyways, it says this. The mentioned angel scroll is not the same as the one Strudgenal saw on microfilm, as it was a complete copy of the Book of Enoch, and as is shown in the text above. The time when he saw it was during the Kuwaiti crisis in 1990 and 1991. The contents of the angel scroll are further described on the page the link points to. A value here may be the information that another scroll had been sold to someone in Europe, the bankers mentioned by Strugno. It is not entirely clear whether it is the Enoch scroll, the one Strugno said was in Jordan, or one of the others mentioned unnamed scrolls. Unfortunately, Strugno died in 2007, and any memoirs have not come out, so there will probably be no more information from him, unless there are left behind materials that will be published posthumously, Anything more about the Angel Scroll has not emerged. Just a little bit more here. Um, regarding the new Enoch papyrus fragment. A few more years ago, and in 2004, something happens again. A papyrus fragment of the Book of Enoch has been found, which is unusual because most earlier found Dead Sea Scroll fragments were made of parchment. It means that the Book of Enoch was published in both papyrus and pipe and parchment. It also means that the number of the various editions of the Book of Enoch found among the Dead Sea Scrolls increases, which is showing its importance and distribution. Again, affirming that you know the Book of Enoch, multiple copies were found at the at Qumran, and it shows that the Book of Enoch was uh, the most prized and valuable 
valued of all the texts. All right. The following is from the blog Paleo Judica in October 2004 and begins with a quote from a list of all known references to the desirable Enoch scroll. P. Ross in Scientific America, Volume 263, November number 5, November 1990, refers to a nearly complete scroll, but doesn't state if it is a Enoch or another book. A. Katzman in Biblio Biblical Archaeology Review, Volume 17, January, February 1991, page 64 and 70, mentions a complete copy of the Book of Enoch. H. Shanks, Interviewing Strudnell in Biblical Archaeology Review, Volume 20, Number 4, 1994, mentions the complete Book of Enoch on microfilm and in a rather mixed-up conversation also mentions Cave 11. In Silverman, in the Hidden Scrolls, Christianity, Judaism, and the War of the Dead Sea Scrolls, 1994, page 162, mentions a complete manuscript of the Book of Enoch. Fan, in a web article, The Visions of Yeshua ben Padiah Scroll, 1999, mentions a rather well-preserved scroll resembling the Book of Enoch. It is not clear if this is the same manuscript as the other Enoch manuscript, which is mentioned by Shanks as being seen by Shrugno on microfilm rather than the actual manuscript. And so it seems that there are multiple copies of the Book of Enoch out there, full extinct copies. All right, the last portion that I'm going to read. There's much more, and I'll post the link to this in the chat room, but this is the last. Uh, we actually, I won't even be able to uh, read this. Uh, we're at the end. Uh, Kathy, I want to actually give you a chance for a final comment in here, and then I'll, I'll make one. Oh, I, I found a link to it, but it's just amazing to me that this exists, and, and it's um, the historical value is it's um, it's without price i mean it's it's priceless right and yet it's hidden from us you know it's it's like so much but anyway it's it's just amazing and it's something that i believe completely that the most high would have um come forth at this time so it's it's wonderful to to at least share it yeah and uh and most people don't know that you know they actually found this entire Aramaic manuscript of the Book of Enoch, uh, and that they've been hiding it from us. And so, you know, I, I wish, again, I wish I could get a copy of it, and it would inspire me to learn Aramaic, just so I could, you know, actually translate it and read it. Um, and, ah, uh, that would be an amazing thing. I mean, but you... Other people, I mean, you can run after UFOs and, you know, all of that crazy stuff, you know, without, with abandon and get on, you know, History Channel 2 and, and all that. But it, anything that would validate historically biblical accuracy or the fullness of the, the biblical narrative, that's going to be suppressed and hidden away. Yeah, it is. It's so sad. It's the Smithsonian I was thinking of. <laughs> right. They've you know, destroyed or hidden and, you know, that you can't um, know this information will we'll protect you. It's right. the Big Bang. You know, mm. we, you're insignificant. Right. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, thank you, Olive. Um, and I will check that out. And also, just think of all the material, just the, the Vatican, you know, all those hordes oh. and hordes of books that we don't have access to. I mean... Yeah, so much hidden away from us. God bless all. Thank you. God Thank bless you. you. Talk to you soon.
Christian Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess a new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv You're listening to Revolution Radio. Welcome everybody. I'm your host, Ben Garcia. This is Momentary Ben here on Revolution Radio. Freedomslips.com And I normally usually open with a poem, but I'm unable to do so this evening because all my files are lost. My computer got corrupted, and so I no longer have access to a lot of that stuff. And so um, so we're going to forego the poem. But this evening, and I hope that everybody is well out there, and I thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. I have as co-host with me this uh, Kathy Dunson. Kathy, are you there, sister? I'm here. You sound a little muted. I guess it's your new arrangement. Um, it could be. I can check the sound quality. Okay. I just wanted to. Yeah. Ask. No, this computer is completely different. I'm working on a loaner laptop, which I want to give a shout out to George and thank him for even hooking me up with this backup which i'm really glad that he did because uh, yay george <laughs> yeah because otherwise i wouldn't be even able to do the the shows that were we can uh, hear you things. fine i mean oh, i can't can. yeah okay. uh does it sound normal no no okay so maybe i should turn up the volume uh, so it's not as loud as normal then um Right. Anybody in chat want to co-sign that for me? Yeah. Or... <laughs> yeah. No, that, well, that's terrible because I've got so many guest appearances coming up. Oh, but... that's right. Tonight's with Rob. Too. Yeah. And then tomorrow I'll be on with uh, John uh, Pounders, Now You See TV. And then the following I'll be on with uh, Chad Riley. Um, well, you sound, okay, so we, we'll clear it up right here while we can. You sound clear, um, but it just sounds like uh, you're talking through a sock. Well, that's not good. <laughs> but oh, it sounds goodness. clear. Well, I don't want to sound like I'm coming through a sock, but... Um, <laughs> It is what it is until I can get this all situated. Uh, hopefully, at least uh, a, a third Baruch, and it's a Slavonic version, but it actually describes 409,000 giants as being um, slaughtered in the deluge of that particular, of Noah's day. And in the other one, it mentions 109,000 giants. And so there were when you consider um, that a lot of the texts described, they're just consuming all the, the staples of the earth and, uh, and then even going as far as to starting to cannibalize humanity, um, the evil was very prevalent and they were even warring against each other and slaughtering one another and consuming all the the goods of the world, and so um, 109,000 giants, that's, a, that's quite a number, and the kind of destruction which could be created by them, especially if you consider that the stature of the pre-Diluvian giants was of very much and greater um, than the even the size of the skeletons which were found even to 1800 
1900s, which were, we're talking giants of 36, 32, 34 feet. Uh, I mean, which is huge in, in comparison to what is discovered um, here in America during the time of the pioneers when they, when they were knocking down all of these uh, huge stone structures and finding giants that were you know, 12 to 15 feet, uh, which usually here in America they did not, uh, or the earlier, I mean, the, the at least the last couple of hundred years, they weren't very much larger than that. But in some of the other places in Europe uh, during previous generations, there were many skeletons which were found in excess of 20 feet. And there was even mention of um, Ecuadorian giants recently. A couple skeletons being put on display that I think were 24 feet. And, and so, and it's my opinion that the giants of um, the before Noah's flood were of very much larger stature. How much so, we don't know, but you know, some of the Biblical text, the narrative, like the extra biblical text, they speak of them as being as tall as the cedars of Lebanon, which are giant trees, and and also uh, reaching up unto the clouds. So, um, you know, who knows how exactly tall they were, how big and how large in stature, uh, but the Book of Enoch also speaks of. 300 L's, which I'm not exactly sure the, you know, the, um, how much that is, but certainly they were a very much larger stature and had greater longevity than uh, the giants after the floods of Noah's day. Kathy, do you have a comment? Um, oh, I had um, pulled up 300 L's and converted it to miles once, and I don't remember what it was. Oh, really? Miles? Yeah, you know, well, I think miles. it was like a half a mile. I mean, it was insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty amazing. Um, but I guess, since we have a little time, what I'll do is go ahead and start reading from this, this book of Jasher, which would be chapter 5, just to set the premise for our discussion after the first break, but um, speaking about Enoch uh, and why he was basically, you know, translated, he was taken alive. He was one of these two witnesses, he, he and Elijah, and, um, and also this connects with the Revelation 11, the two witnesses at the end of days, because um, as I show in my seventh book, those two witnesses will be Enoch and Elijah. I know a lot of people say Moses and Enoch or, you know, Moses and somebody else, but um, there are many texts which reference Enoch and Elijah by name. And I think that that has to do with their having never died and, uh, and having never had to succumb to death and that the to witnesses of Revelation 11, they are killed by the Antichrist and left in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days, uh, which is also um, a type and shadow of the three and a half years of the latter part of the tribulation, which is um, what the when they come and testify against the Antichrist is during that second portion and that that is the part of the tribulation where he is out in front and center and um, ruling over what will be the the new world order the organization of the new world order as one world government one world religion one world uh, people one world economy all of that which you know the fact that we see all of this um reflected in where we are in this day and age is to in to my opinion um is a reflection of how late the hour is and you know that 
21 trillion dollars in debt and climbing every second of every moment and at some point the party will be over and the uh, the whole thing that they have been planning and preparing for with uh, the collapse of the global economy um, you know and the 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 world financial institutions and the order out of chaos and basically to recreate a new system out of the ashes of the old um, that's what they have planned and all of that in my opinion will be part and connected to what is the un saved from a commentary um i really like to read this it's called lost and rejected scriptures by um lumpkin joseph lumpkin and yeah. he he says Enoch was considered inspired and authentic by certain Jewish sects of the first century BC and remained popular for at least 500 years. So that's contemporary contemporaneous with uh, the time of Yeshua. And he also added the original was apparently written in the Semitic language now thought to be Aramaic. So he confirmed that. Right, right. Yeah, and um, after this first particular you know, just after sharing some discussion on it, I will actually read a little bit about um, some discussions and some confirmations of an individual that was approached with a, a microfilm copy of this full um, book of Enoch. But what is really interesting about the whole discussion with this older version is that many people... Um, because, you know, we have the Book of Enoch from the Ethiopic, um, they say it doesn't go back as far as this older version. You know, being found with the Dead Sea Scrolls would make it uh, thousands of years old and older than even the time of Christ or at least near and around that particular uh, time era. But... Um, because the newer versions and there's there's debate as to whether a certain portion of the book of Enoch is found in the original translations and those would have to do with many of the prophecies of Christ which are included in the books of Enoch that speak of um, Yeshua as the son of God the son of man and also about his returning with 10,000s of his angels and you know also with the saints and it's a um, a book that was written for a future generation and our being the that particular generation in my opinion um, but also in, when when we come back from the first break too I'm going to share a portion from the book of Jasher which speaks about Enoch and his high regard and his high standing with the Most High God and um, why he was taken as basically as, um, you know, to be character witness against the watchers, but also um, to write down the testimonies of all the sins of the, the children that were born of the watchers, which are the, the giants and their involvement in what became the corruption and the pollution of the pre uh, the antediluvian age and they were really the focus and the reason for the flood being brought upon the earth and um, as it says in uh, second Baruch which I believe is the Greek version there's also um, you know, at least people will be able to be able to tell what I'm talking about, what I'm saying, what I'm reading, even though the sound quality will be off from what is normal. But I will definitely see if I can turn up the volume and maybe even speak a little bit louder and and see if that helps out yeah, in any they, way. They agree with me in chat. It sounds a little muffled. Oh no. Okay, well, now you, at least you know why, and um, 
and it's not, you know, the mic because it's the same mic. I just converted it over to this laptop. I, I have a very superior uh, computer, you know, as far as my main computer. And so the sound quality, the sound card, everything is uh, of much superior quality over there. And so I'm, I'm guessing that has to be the difference because all the settings and everything are the same. And so anyways, just bear with me, everyone. And again, thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. We're going to talk about the book of Enoch and um, also about Enoch himself, just as being a prophet. And um, man, that is just terrible that things are not as good uh, just because I've got all of these guest appearances. Hmm. But anyways, um, and so, uh, Kathy, you had sent me a couple things, too, that you had wanted to possibly bring up in uh, talking about this particular topic. And But what is really interesting to me, and it's something that I will uh, go into in greater detail in speaking about the Book of Enoch, is that, uh, and a lot of people don't know this, but during the, when the Dead Sea Scrolls are found, all of that material back in 1947, I believe it was, the Nag Hammadi Codices and all of that material was found in 46, if I'm correct, but um, the Dead Sea Scrolls as a collection, there was a full entire manuscript of the Book of Enoch written in Aramaic, which you know signifies that it is older than all of the copies that we currently have now, which the two books, um, the Enoch one is written in Giz and was rediscovered as part of the Ethiopic canon. And then the second book of Enoch is uh, extant to us in Slavonic, which is interesting. And then there is a third Hebrew um, Enoch but it is more centered on uh, Ishmael, interestingly enough, um, as being the main character of that particular text. But it does speak about the transformation of Enoch into what is the angel Metatron uh, to be as a witness against the watchers for their fall and their interdiction into the affairs of humanity and so um i have a, a note that i uh 